So, for those of you, did everybody hear that? Okay, okay, good. Moving forward. But let me give you some, I can describe the scene for you, though, give you some highlights. First off, this stage, the carpet was blue, and the pews were orange. Oh, yeah, good colors. <laughs> we had columns on either side here, and wrapped, the columns were wrapped with tulle. I had no idea what tulle was, but we had yards of it at my wedding. We had candle operas on each side. Before the ceremony ever started, before anybody was even here, I sat on the very back with my wife's grandfather, and he prayed with me. I remember my grandparents coming up the aisle. This was probably the last event that they would ever attend as age got to them and they were starting to have some health issues. My father-in-law, who promised us without fail that he was not going to get emotional singing, got up, got six words out, and froze. My wife, then, seeing this, took over the song and finished it. Oh yeah, it was cool. We then lighted the unity candle, and we had a process in lighting the candle. Our photographer said, make sure that before you light the candle, you hold your candle and you join them together to create this flame and then bring it down so we could get this photo. It's actually a really cool picture. We have it. Then the, pa the, the ceremony goes, and at the end, the pastor stands and presents to the whole, a whole, all of our attendees, for, I'd like to present to you for the very first time, Mr. and Mr. Brian Topol. <laughs> True story. Isn't it interesting that so much planning goes in for this day, this special day that will never be repeated? You see it on social media all the time, right? The pictures of the venue, the flowers, the food, and of course that famous statement post which has the same general theme Today I get to marry my heart, or my soulmate. I can't believe it's finally here. And of course, it always finishes with blessed, right? Then it's over, then the couple transitions from the wedding to the marriage, and of course, the post changes as well, right? Today I didn't smother my husband with a pillow because of his snoring. Oh, wait, blessed. <laughs> now, as part of the wedding ceremony, the couple will take vows, well, what is a vow? Most would say a vow is a promise, which is technically true, but it's actually more than that. See, the vow, the word vow is defined as one by which a person is bound to an act, service, or condition, like an oath, which you take from the heart. For example, I vow to stand beside you every step of the way. On the other hand, means promising, giving assurance of something. Yeah, I promise I'll pick the kids up from school. See, you take vows, whereas you give a promise. The Bible actually distinguishes it even deeper. Look at Deuteronomy 20, 23, 23 through 21. 21 through 23, sorry. If you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay fulfilling it. For the Lord your God will surely require it of you, and you will be guilty of sin. But if you refrain from vowing, you will not be guilty of sin. You shall be careful to do what is past your lips, for you voluntarily have vowed to the Lord your God what you have promised with your mouth. That's how God views a vow. If you don't fulfill it, it's a sin. Yikes. So we have these vows that take place at the wedding ceremony. And in many ceremonies, there's the standard list, which I, I also did at my wedding day. Right? You've seen these before, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, forsaking all others, till death do us part. What's interesting is that the Bible makes no mention of any type of wedding vows. These vows and others like it were developed over time as marriage transitioned from the transactional type, like keeping property with a family group or a peace treaty between nations, to the love relational type that we have today. What's also interesting is that these type of traditional wedding vows were developed in the Christian religion. The first uses was around 1549 as part of the Roman Catholic ceremony, which has the, I take so-and-so to be my husband and wife. Then the Lutherans expanded it to contain the ones that are most used that I've listed here. 
They, have, they also even add, according to God's holy will, and I pledge to you my faithfulness. So oh, they are not in the Bible. They are specific vows of action that are taking place in his presence and therefore are biblically, the, biblically binding as defined in Deuteronomy 23. Now, we can get caught up in debating that since these aren't specifically in the Bible called out in Scripture that they are not of God. But let's look at them in the context of biblical principles of marriage that are clearly outlined in the Bible. The first wedding was performed by God in the Garden of Eden, right? We see it in Genesis 22 through 20 to 24. Then the Lord God made woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This now, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother, and he's united with, to his wife, and they become one flesh. Jesus reiterates this and even expands on it, as we just heard read so well. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. What God has joined together, let no one separate. See, when we marry, we start as two, we're joined together by God, and we become one. So as one flesh, are we going to experience good times and bad times? Yes. Rich times and poor times? Most definitely. Sick times and healthy times? Absolutely. And the only way for, for one to become two again is through death. So the vows we take are in line with biblical principles. So now we have the one unit. How is this one unit supposed to function? Well, let's look at some familiar verses. Ephesians 22 through 30. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so your wives should submit to your husbands in everything. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present to her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church and we are members of his body. These verses have been the cause of so many disagreements, mostly because everyone focuses on verses 20 through 20, 22 through 24 and stop. Why is it so bad? Because of one simple word, submit. That word has caused so many disagreements on these verses. But su let's look at submit. Submit means to accept or yield to a superior force or to the authority will of another person. Somehow we've interpreted this to mean inferiority which is completely not what it's saying. Submission also does not mean silence. Submission means submission. There is a mission for the marriage, and that mission is obeying and glorifying God. The wife says, I'm going to put myself under that mission. The mission is more important than my individual desires. I'm not putting myself below my husband. I'm putting myself below the mission God has for our marriage for my life. It's important to note there is no place in Scripture that teach unqualified, without exception, submission to anyone except to God and God alone. To violate that is actually to commit the sin of idolatry, right? The view of using verses 23 through 24 to justify the husband's rule over his wife does not work for the simple fact of the instructions given to the household in verses 25 through 26. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. So how did Christ love the church? It says he gave up his life for her. He sacrificed everything. So we are to give up everything for our wife. Verse 28 through 30 tells us to love our wife as we love ourselves. So we take care of our wife as if she was our own body. This makes sense because we're, take, we're talking about one flesh, right? Paul even quotes Genesis 2 and Ephesians 5, in verse 31, says, A man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. It's the partnership 
and putting the other first, which means both are submitting to each other. It boils down to really only one thing, being selfish or selfless. The opinion that the husband rules his wife is not following the instructions of loving her as Christ loved the church, which is being selfish. Why wives not submitting to their husbands is going against the mission and the role in the marriage. How do you, how do you see your spouse? That's the tail, tail sign of where you're at. Do you see all their faults and shortcomings, what they are not giving you or what you think they should be giving you? Or do you see them the way God sees them? He doesn't see their faults. He doesn't see any of their shortcomings. All he sees, all he sees is one glor- of his glorious children whom he loves with all that he has and how he can bless them. That's the love he has for them. What kind of love do you have? If you see them through God's eyes and treat them the way we are told in these verses, then you are truly united and are selfless, not selfish. Selfishness is what destroys marriages. In my opinion, it's the reason for most divorces. You read when a couple is getting a divorce, they cite irreconcilable differences. In fact, it accounts for more than 50% of all divorce claims. So what does it even mean? Irreconcilable just means I have ideas, facts, or statements representing findings or points of view that are so different from each other they can't even be made compatible. So when you combine that with differences, you get the inability to agree on most things or on important things. So let me get this straight. This person whom we, as we said earlier, was your heart or your soulmate and blessed. Now you can't agree on anything? Or maybe you just can't even stand them. Let's look at some of the top irreconcilable differences. These are the top ten. Disagreement on finance and debt problems. Loss of trust in the relationship. Work that causes protracted long-distance separation. Lack of physical intimacy. Personality conflicts. Communication difficulties. Failure to help in the household. Differing political opinions. In-law and familial, as I quote-unquote relating to families in general, typical family involvement, and growing apart due to different life and goals and interests. Those are the irreconcilable differences. But I want to pause for just one second. So I'm focusing on this section when it talks of reasons for divorce. I'm not talking about any issues related to any type of abuse, which is a whole other topic. And I'm not by any means going to be dismissing it at all. But you'll see it would need to be addressed separately. Okay, so can we just take that? Going back to the list, though, these are real issues that face marriages every day. However, biblically, none of these are grounds for divorce. There's only one issue that God allows for divorce, which is not on the list, and that is infidelity. The reason he allows it, although reluctantly, is because the one flesh has been violated, which breaks it apart, and it's extremely difficult or maybe impossible to repair. God shows us his feelings on this subject in Malachi 2.16. For I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. To divorce your wife is to overwhelm her with cruelty, says the Lord of heaven's armies. So guard your heart. Do not be unfaithful to your wife. Looking at that list at these items through a selfish lens, we can put all kinds of justifications as to why we cannot work these issues out with our spouse. However, if we view them through the lens of selflessness and through the verses of loving our spouse as Christ loves, nothing on this list is insurmountable. Trust me, I know these are not small things. These are real issues. And if you think after 27 years of marriage that my wife and I had to deal with some of these things, you'd be really mistaken. But in addition to the biblical instructions, there were the vows that were taken. Remember these vows. For better or for worse. For richer or for poorer. In sickness and in health. Forsaking all others. Till death do us part. When you can't or refuse to deal with these differences, then what you're actually saying is, all I wanted was the better, the richer, the health, and unfortunately, I wanted others. Society has polluted marriage to the point where it's not about God or the other person. It's strictly about what can that person do for me? And when that person can no longer give me what I want, then I'll just move on. Because it wasn't me that caused the problems. It's the other person. When it's I and not we, there is no marriage. There is no one flesh. 
Marriage is more than just the union of a man and a woman. It's actually God's symbol on earth of the relationship he desires with us. He refers to himself as the bridegroom. He desires the most intimate relationship with us as a husband and wife, as a husband and wife have with each other. John paints the picture both in Revelation 19:7 and 19:9. Let us be glad and rejoice, and let us give honor to him, for the time has come for the wedding feast of the Lamb, and his, and his bride has prepared for herself. Nine, verse 9, And the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. And he added, These are true words that come from God. Since marriage is God's earthly symbol of relationship he wants with us, I submit that how you treat your spouse is indicative of where you're at with your relationship of God with God. Let me say that again. How you are treating your spouse is indicative of where you are at with your relationship with God. Paul even says it in Ephesians 5. Look at, look at verse 32. This is a great mystery, but it's an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. An illustration, a diagram, an example used to make something clear. That's the definition of an illustration. So the marriage relationship is, in fact, an example of how a relationship is to be with Christ. Let's look at the greatest commandment. Matthew 22, 37 through 38. Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. So if you're not loving the person on earth whom you are joined to as Christ loves... How can you say that you are following this commandment? Think about the next greatest commandment, Matthew twenty-two thirty-nine. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. If we can't even talk to our spouse, how are we loving our neighbor as ourselves? I want to look at the vows again in this context. Again, hear the vows again. So do we only come to God when things are bad? Do we only come to God when we think to give us something because we're, we're in a bad financial situation? Do we only come to God when we're sick? And then when we see we're not getting what we want, do we then go off and go find another God, right? A different thing that's going to suit our needs. And the good news is that we don't need the last vow because unless we decide to not accept life through Christ, then there is no death because we're joined with him. But here's the thing, though. With him, we can see the better in the worst, we can see the richer in the poor, and we can see the health in the sickness because he's with us. He provides, he gives us all that we need to go through any of these things. Let's look at that irreconcilable differences through the lens of relationship with Christ. Disagreement in finance and, and debt problems. The Bible has very specific instructions on money and especially debt. Are you obeying those principles? Loss of trust in the relationship. Do you trust that God is working in your life? Or as more and more things keep happening, you aren't sure God's doing anything about it. Work that causes protracted long-distance separation. Do you get so busy with everything else in your life that your time with God gets less and less, even to the point where there is none? Lack of physical intimacy. Again, this type of intimacy is the earthly symbol of the type of closeness and connection that God desires. How is your connection. Personality conflict. Does our personality conflict with God's in a lot of areas of our lives? We want things to go a certain way, and sometimes those ways are contradictory to what God wants. Communication difficulties. How's your communication? As with marriage, we sometimes think thinks it's all one-sided, and the other person is not even listening. As it relates to God, to our godly relationship, it's not that he's not listening, it's that we aren't listening. There are so many ways that God communicates to us, not just through the still small voice as we pray, but also the way situations unfold and even using other people. But we're so caught up in ourselves, we fail to pay attention to all the times he talks to us. Failure to help in the household. The household here represents the church, not the physical building. You and me, we are the church. So what are we doing to help the church? This to re relates to where you're at in your spiritual walk. What I mean is you go from what God can do for me to what, what can I do for God. The first part is our baby stage in our walk, the gimme stage. But we aren't supposed to spend our entire lives in this stage. By the way, the what can I do for God sta stage has way more rewards than what can God do for me. Differing political opinions. 
This one's interesting because God doesn't care about politics. And unfortunately, he's being completely misused in a, it, for other people to use them for their own agenda. Their agenda is not love-centered, but self-centered, which separates people. God's sole agenda, the agenda he died for all of us, is for all of us to be united with him in love. In-law and family, family involvement. Like the household, how are, you, how are you with your church family? Are you more concerned about what you can get out of church than what you can bring to the church? Again, we talk about it every week. This church is trying to grow based on relationships. But as Mel, but as Mel likes to say, we're all a bunch of mixed nuts, right? So there are going to be personality conflicts. But as the Bible says in Ephesians 4.23, instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Growing apart due to different life goals and interests. Are my goals in line with what God wants for me? Or am I on a path that's just for my own gratification? You see, like the earthly marriage, if we are selfish, none of these can be resolved. However, if we are selfless, Every one of these differences can be. I know someone every day, he prays for God to perfect our character. And that's a good prayer. But really, that prayer could be modified to say, help us to surrender and make us selfless. If that was the only character trait that was perfected, I believe that would cover everything. John, first, John, second John 1, 6. And this love that we walk in obedience to commands, as you have heard from the beginning, this is... His command is that you walk in love. Marriage, both to you, your spouse, and to God, is the greatest connection we can have. I like the way Joyce Meyer says it. Are you married to Jesus or just dating him? See, there's nothing legally binding when we're dating, right? Property or money or anything else. But when we're married and we become one, everything is available. So when we marry Jesus, all that he has and is is ours, we are in him and he is in us. The Bible says that. John 4, 15 through 16. All declare that Jesus is the Son of God, have God living in them, and they live in God. We know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in his love. God is love. All who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. It gets even better. Let's look at verse 17. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. If that's not character perfection, I don't know what is. It's entirely up to you what kind of marriage you want to have, both with your spouse and you single people, don't leave you out, with God. Both take commitment, both take work, but the benefits you receive from both are so amazing. It's not easy, which is why you take a vow, again, a vow is more than a promise. It's a total dedication to be selfless and not selfish. And in the case of taking Jesus, it's a matter of choosing life over death. Either way, it's all your choice. I want to invite the praise team up now. We're going to sing, I Surrender All. And why, while you are singing this, I want you to really look at yourself and think, you know what? If you've never accepted Christ and want to, go ahead and surrender it to him. If you're married to Jesus, but you know it's been a long time that you've spent time with him and want to reconnect with him, make that choice. If, you're, if you've divorced Jesus and you're not walking with him and completely absorb your own world and you want to remarry him, make that decision. Again, it's always up to you. He gives us free will to do any of it, but he is begging you, begging you to spend time with him. Marry him. Heavenly Father, thank you for being here. Thank you for your never-ending, never-ceasing love. Be with all of us, Lord. Help us to always surrender to you, our blessed Savior, who not just wants us to be with you. We thank you for the gift. We thank you for the constant blessings you give us. Be with us the rest of this Sabbath, Lord, and the rest of this week. We thank you and love you in Jesus' name. Amen.